Welcome everybody to the panel this morning. So as this will proceed as follows. I will, first of all, I will introduce the panelists. Then each panelist gets uh, three minutes to state their position on the topic of the discussion, which is automated and mathematical discovery. Then there's a second round again, roughly three minutes where the panelists can react to this. And after that, we open up to the audience and you can sort of start asking questions to, to the panelists. And then we just go back and forth. We have an hour or so set aside for this. So um, yeah, let me just start by introducing the panelists in order in which they are seated. First, David McAllister, of course, and you've seen him talk, so I will be very brief. And he's a professor at Toyota Technological Institute at Chicago, and he's done a lot of work on AI. That's his interest. He received his uh, PhD from MIT under assessment, and already back then he was working on um, AI or theorem proving. He then went to Cornell, uh, Cornell MIT, AT&T, and... Um, uh, is it now TTIC? TTIC, oh, yeah. yeah, it's now at TTIC. Uh, Mike, of course, um, you also saw him um, already present. So Mike is, um, is in Harvard. He received his PhD from Caltech under John Schwartz and then was a postdoc at the University of Chicago in Rutgers. Then he worked at ENS Economics as Superior at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab went back to Rutgers and the Institut des Hautes Scientifique in uh, Paris, or south, south of Paris. And then he was the first prominent member of the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics in Stony Brook. Mike has worked on all, all sorts of things in physics and string theory. It's probably the research that I know best, but uh, he has always, or he has uh, had a lot of very interesting research program computational methods very, very early on. Next, we have Ji Wan Li, who is a professor for mathematics at the uh, University of Connecticut, and has also done a lot of work on connecting mathematics and machine learning. He received his PhD from Seoul National University and uh, uh, Sok Jin Yang. And before he joined UConn, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at uh, Seoul National University and at the University of Toronto. And so you might have seen his paper on murmurations of elliptic curves, and actually that's what inspired the picture on the on the on the post of this work. And um, lastly, we have uh, Rory. It's okay, Rory. Rory <laughs> Battleday. So he's a postdoc here at the Harvard Center for brain for brain science. He received his PhD in computer science from Princeton and a medical doctor from Oxford. And he's working on, with uh, Sam Gershman here. So please welcome our panelists, and um, then we get into the first question. All right, so we will go to an order, and you can make a statement about what you think. Um, so discoveries. math is zero. You know, if you want to do what's analogous to alpha zero, you're starting from nothing. Right, and you have to define concepts. So how do we think about where concepts in mathematics come from? When I took point set topology from Munkers, at some point he said, and I will always remember this, topology originates and is formulated to find the abstract setting of the concept of continuity. So we start with real numbers, we start with continuous functions over real numbers, and somehow we find the place where the concept of continuity can be defined at, at, a, at, a, at the most abstract level, and then we can use it in many places. So how do we automate the process of going from, say, a definition and a concrete representation and factor it into uh, an abstraction followed by a definition in terms of the abstraction? So presumably this is, and, and how do we, I mean, and another problem is how do you know when that's a useful concept? Um, so this is supposed to be a three-minute inter introduction. Um, the problem of what's useful is also very difficult. Right? Um, mathematicians tend to be competitive, and to be competitive, they love to take unproven theorems and prove how smart they are. Um, and that's probably not 
pursuing, you know, whatever. Do we believe in a notion of significance in mathematics that's objective? Because if we wanted to start math zero, we would sort of need such a thing. And I would like to think that it might exist, um, but it's very difficult. My turn? Yes. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, first, uh, there, there, there are sort of uh, criteria that everybody would agree about success of uh, automated mathematical discovery. And one of them is, of course, we judge its output as, um, you know, we judge another mathematician. And uh, the other is that it can make a sustained uh, level of progress. It can first discover something, then things build on that, then things build on that. Your mathematics has these you know, remarkable series of uh, levels of development that uh, in principle never end. Okay, so where, where are we at in terms of uh, those goals? Well, there is a history of uh, systems that do automated mathematical discovery, very, very famously a Doug Lernat, a system called the AM back in the uh, 70s. And then uh, work, I, I mentioned the system called the Graffiti, the systems of GT, some others that generally use this uh, old fashioned AI, you know, kind of expert systems approach, but were enough, successful enough to, to kind of be interesting. And I, I refer you to the review that I had, I had in my slides. And uh, so they face these problems that I mentioned of uh, a system to be countered as, you know, working you know, automatically should, you know, select statements that it tries to conjecture or prove. And then it has to rank, at the very least, rank them and say, you know, here's a really interesting statement. You know, and then we, I'll come back to the question of should we really count that as a discovery, given that it's only ranking the things, and that's in some sense modeling. So, so, so we make this criteria, and the system should understand that it's made a significant discovery. Ranking is a very minimal form of that. You could say it's just modeling human understanding in some way, but nevertheless, it's something. And um, so basically the status was they, they, these systems with very tiny computers, very primitive stuff, were able to discover enough to kind of establish the concept and to show that there are definitions of this kind of interestingness that, that work. And they're based on what you would think are the obvious criteria. It has to be a new thing. You know, it has to be general. You know, it has to, uh, you know, surprise is worth something. Uh, you know, there's a list of criteria that you can give. And uh, so on some level, but on only the lowest level, because they were not able to make significant discoveries, they were not able to build on their discoveries and advance through uh, you know, levels of discovery and so forth. And so the problem seems to be totally wide open. Uh, the, you know, again, this, this early work uh, did lay out interesting criteria for an interestingness function, you know, like an objective function that the system could use to sort through candidate conjectures and uh, decide you know, which are the ones that are really interesting to follow up on, which ones should I report as my discoveries. It's, it's kind of complicated. Again, it's, it's sort of more modeling human concepts of understanding. So my, my own thinking led to the idea that it would really be much better if the system could somehow learn this definition of interestingness by analogy, if you will, to the language model. What is the language model? is defined to just predict a probability distribution over next words, and yet it has these emergent abilities. And uh, so wouldn't it be better to have some simpler, you know, proto-interestingness or you know, objective, which uh, then has the actual discovery of emergent, uh, you know, of, of interesting things and the criteria that determine a statement is interesting as emergent. And I, I, again, I think there are interesting things you can make in that direction. An example I'll give is that uh, there's this game that you might like to pose of uh, there are agents uh, A and B, and uh, you know, a problem to be interesting should be uh, you know, difficult, but not too difficult. It should be solvable. And uh, of course, there are many other criteria. And uh, so A could give problems to B, and if they're too easy to solve or too hard to solve, then that's uh, no good. But how do you judge that? And uh, now you could put it into a, a, a good answer, I think, a potentially good answer is you have a system with three agents, A, B, C, that are trying to produce, you know, A produces a problem which it gives to B and C. And if both of them can solve it, it's too easy. If neither of them can solve it, it's too hard. But those problems that are right in between are at the level of difficulty, which is interesting. And so that's an example of this sort of emergent uh, 
notion of uh, interestingness. And so I think uh, that would be a promising direction to study uh, systems, perhaps multi-agent systems in which the interestingness criteria, which again, something is known about emerge and that that could be a basis for a modern AI discovery system. Great. Yeah. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, the automated mathematical discovery would be realized in a few years, and even in a lower level. Uh, the combination of uh, large language models and proof of assistant systems and reinforcement learning uh, seems to be highly effective. The pace of the developments is uh, very fast and astounding. But at first, uh, the main problem will be that um, the conjectures and theorems generated by AI may be of a low quality. And AI, AI may generate a huge number of uh, trivial results uh, or simple consequences of uh, the known results. So already it's uh, pointed out by Mike, but I think it's very crucial that we develop certain methods to evaluate um, the depth and potential impact of uh, you know, <coughs> mathematical, I mean, the automated discoveries. Otherwise, we may be overwhelmed by a flood of uh, meaningless results, and then we may, we may be in big trouble. Uh, to obtain uh, some substantial results and outcomes, uh, uh, we may have to formalize uh, major parts of mathematics. Uh, without formalization, we, we may not be able to make a computer understand mathematics in a true sense, uh, and we may not be able to eliminate hallucination completely. Um, so I think formalization is uh, essential. Uh, but currently, the formalization process is uh, very burdensome. And uh, we must uh, simplify the process or uh, find a certain ways to uh, automate it. So we have to already talk about, well, I mean, we already talked about auto formalization. Uh, I think uh, it's a very crucial step toward this uh, uh, automated mathematical discovery. And if we have an extensive uh, uh, the libraries of uh, formalized the theorems and proofs and mathematical objects, then uh, that will enable AI to uh, discover some connections, uh, un unexpected connections between different areas of uh, mathematics. And um, the AI may recognize certain interesting patterns and uh, structures across uh, the uh, different fields. Uh, and that may lead to uh, the formulation of a uh, high quality conjectures. So I think again, the huge library of, uh, libraries of uh, formalized mathematics uh, is important. And um, however, uh, even if uh, we formalize all current mathematics and AI knows all existing proofs, uh, that may not be enough. So real progress uh, uh, will be achieved when AI can introduce new concepts and can um, develop uh, entirely new theories. So this requires uh, a high level of abstraction and creativity. So such a system should be able to uh, develop some frameworks that unify a broad range of uh, uh, mathematical structures and uh, phenomena. So basically we need to, I mean, the question is, can we make an AI growth index or an AI blankness? I think that's the, the essential question. And as far as I know, current systems are far, far from um, having these abilities. So for the time being, in my opinion, uh, um, in my opinion, uh, human intervention uh, will remain essential and uh, human mathematicians will enjoy collaboration with AI. So AI uh, can check the correctness of proof and uh, perform routine tasks and uh, suggest some uh, possible steps. And human mathematicians may be able to focus 
more on uh, the creative side of uh, cre creative aspects of discovery. Um, so that would be really good for the time being. But uh, eventually, eventually, as AI becomes more and more sophisticated, um, uh, it will make uh, autonomous mathematical discoveries of a high quality. Uh, then the human mathematicians will face some profound existential questions. Uh, for example, um, if an AI uh, were to produce the proof of uh, Riemann hypothesis uh, by establishing new theories in you know, a million pages, and if a no human can understand fully, fully understand the uh, uh, proof, then uh, what would be the role and meaning of a human mathematician? So we have a one million page uh, proof, but nobody can really understand. Is it a proof or not? And anyway, so, um, so the, I think we have to start thinking about these questions now uh, so that we may be prepared. All right. Thank you. So thank you for having me, everyone. This has been fascinating so far. And I guess, I think I was invited here because with Sam Gershman, who was here earlier, I recently put out a paper called AI for Science, the easy and the hard problems. And in this paper, we argued that current algorithmic scientists were getting good at solving the easy problem. That is, once an optimization problem had been specified, generating a solution to that problem, but were distinctly lacking at the ability to solve what we call the hard problem, coming up with the problem itself. Now, as a scientist, that's an integral part of work and happens often and requires taking an ill-defined problem or set of phenomena and working them out into a well-defined form optimization problem to which tools can then be subsequently applied. So in thinking about mathematics, I'm curious to know whether the idea of problem synthesis is equally problematic and difficult. And the, I guess the second set of observations we've had is that even if one did have a system that kind of could pose problems in order to subsequently solve, there seems to be the, the case we've heard a little bit now of determining whether they're interesting or not. And so we've been thinking quite a lot about whether there could be um, you know, automatic ways of dealing whether something's interesting or whether that will always require a human in the loop, human in the process. And so I think a second role that I can play here is that I, I must be the least mathematical person in the room, but I was very fortunate in that after doing uh, studying neuroscience and a medical degree, I then went on to take an undergraduate mathematics or PhD in computer science, and I sort of felt like a bit of an anthropologist because I got to watch the, um, the way mathematics was taught and proof-based mathematics, and I found it fascinating. And um, today so far, maybe later in the workshop, we'll hear a little bit more about, okay, well, how would you teach a human? How do you, we teach human mathematicians? What's the set of curricula we go through? How do we establish kind of what good proof techniques are and practices? And just a kind of little excerpt from my experience was when I first started taking proof-based courses, I would get very frustrated at the word recognize because I would, you know, you'd be following a proof in a lecture and um, the word recognize would then usually uh, kind of bring in a concept you hadn't been thinking about for a little while or, you know, you didn't know how you would have generated. And I guess initially I was a little bit frustrated because I would like to learn the learn the procedures by which you could generate the system instead of just recognizing it. I think that's intimately related to this idea of the easy problem and the hard problem. If you have the representation after you've solved a problem, I'm not saying it's easy to solve it, but you know it's at least conceivable how you might go about doing it. But how does one come up with that final represent representation itself? And I guess when I did you know, harder and harder courses and, you know, not following through proofs and lectures, but going home and working on problem sets, meeting, meeting mathematicians, you started to work out that there was definitely a kind of curriculum involved in the demonstrations you were getting through these, through proofs, through solving them and through help. And so I, I think maybe because AI seems to be turning more towards um, thinking about automated learning systems as like children we're raising and conversing with, um, conversations about how we might begin to build in a training program in mathematics in the service of discovery, I'd, I'd be very interested to explore what kind of concepts and techniques 
people thought were necessary to do that. Thank you very much. So now we have a second round where we can, um, so if the panel can react to whatever was said. I don't know, one, one thing that was said, um, I personally, as an AI person, believe that I am a machine. So the idea that there's anything that ultimately requires people, I reject because I am a machine, eventually a machine can eat me or you know, humans. Um, so eventually we will have creative, you know, we'll have a growth and deco or an ID computer. Um, obviously, we are very far from that. Um, although we've been so, in 2009 ish, I started giving lectures about a Moore's Law of AI. Back then, we were working in computer vision and you know, we had at TTIC, we had the best object detection system for in computer vision that there was. We had something called the informable part model. And uh, performance was getting significantly better every year. You know, our error rate would be dropped by 30% every year. Uh, and I said, and I would give talks back in 2009 saying, if we can maintain significant progress every year, this is going to get really interesting in a decade. Um, and that turned out to, you know, that held up. Whether that will, you know, can we make significant progress every year? I feel like the past, this past year has not been nearly as traumatic as the year before. So it feels like something has slowed down. But that happened before too. And then there was a breakthrough, you know. So I wouldn't rule out you know, full human equivalence in five or 10 years. I wouldn't rule it out, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but um, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's scary and it, it puts me under enormous time pressure because it could be all over in five years. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll address maybe some of uh, Rudy's uh, comments. So uh, he talked about uh, you know, the uh, easy and hard problems, which uh, I've only read his paper once, but uh, maybe briefly stated is, you know, the, again, the ability to solve a problem, which was posed to the computer, the ability to come up with a, a fruitful question or a problem is, is a you know, hard problem. And uh, then uh, I think, uh, both the earlier work that I quoted and the language model work uh, kind of uh, brings home, I think, I think a, a point which, you, David, you, you can comment is uh, kind of accepted in AI, which is that creativity in itself is not really so difficult. I mean, at least our algorithms that are creative and, and just mutating things, you know, but the, the hard thing is to create significant, you know, good stuff, you know, that's our, and uh, so uh, these are, uh, Sock systems that I cited did come up with uh, meaningful conjectures. They generally did it by producing you know, models of their axioms and then looking at the properties of those models and trying to abstract things. And then they used this interestingness criterion. And uh, you know, of course, a, a language model does you know, mutate. You, know, you, you could come up with a plausible sounding mathematical conjecture. Of course, you look at the details and it tends to be something which was already proven or false, you know, or trivially false, but uh, it, does, it, it is creative. So, so the, the harder problem I would call it is just, you know, combining this uh, creativity with all the constraints that have to be brought together with the creativity to make uh, meaningful advances. And uh, I think that's harder, but I don't see the evidence that it's fundamentally different than the other challenges of uh, AI. And uh, so I would tend to agree with uh, David that uh, the progress that uh, you know, some of the, the recent rate of progress suggests that this, this problem too will fall in the uh, coming years. And uh, on the other hand, it, it is a very challenging and interesting problem. You know, so what, what exactly now is it involved? Yeah, I also have uh, some, uh, I want to make a comment on timeline. So when I was a college student, uh, people said that computer cannot 
like a defeat of human being in the play, I mean, go game, because a computer cannot see the patterns. That was like about 30 years ago, but that's not true anymore. So I mean, at that time, I believed it. So uh, a go game is uh, really human, and then uh, a computer will never defeat a human being because of the problem of pattern recognition. But that's not true anymore. We know that uh, AlphaGo uh, could be the human champion. Um, so right now, the next question may be like a creativity. Can a machine really uh, become create, creative and can find some new concepts and do a high level abstraction? Then maybe uh, the next uh, like a question and the next level. I think it's, it's possible in about well, I don't know exact time, of course I cannot, but uh, in 30 years, I think it's, uh, it's coming. So yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, I should probably make a prediction, but, uh, but I don't have the confidence in doing so. Yeah, I think, so I think the point of the, the paper uh, that Sam and I wrote is to sort of emphasize these understudied aspects of creativity as um, as candidates for thinking about the new sets of inductive biases or um, training sets that would like to train machine learning for science algorithms on. Um, and I was thinking there'd be a parallel in mathematics, a parallel set of data. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much more I have to say than that. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So we open up to the audience that way. Like... Uh, oh, yeah, I'd like, like to go back to this question of. Uh, interest, how you assess the interest of the formulation that a person or a computer might come up with. Uh, and, you know, one comment is perhaps we shouldn't be entirely uh, uh, anthropocentric. And, uh, we might not really understand fully what's interesting. I, mean, I think Go is machines playing Go have taught us that uh, we didn't really get the whole point at the beginning. I, I was just wondering what the panel thought, like the simplest possible definition, which would be just some kind of ratio within a formal language of the length of the statement versus the length of the shortest proof. I mean, that's fairly objective and simple. Is there a better notion of uh, interest? Well, there's, there's connection, right? Mathematicians always talk about connectedness, right? They, they you know, does this result? impact how many areas of mathematics are impacted by this you know. but that's a very high level thing i'm talking about early term like just getting started well, i would say that's, that's a factor but that can't be the only factor and that's going to be maximized by things like you know what's the fifth busy 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 beaver number or something like that and these kind of puzzles that are exactly made to maximize that ratio mm -hmm. like we're so also, I think we we can like measure kind of the size of size of references. If a paper is very influential, then it may be cited uh, like many many times. Likewise, if there is a result, then if it can be used uh, frequently later or immediately, then that may be a um, a measurement of uh, importance. There are also interesting secondary metrics of the impact of the paper uh, that have been developed in philosophy of science, right? And one is that if a lot of papers cited a kind of core canon, and then after a new paper, they stop citing that canon, but cited the new paper, that kind of inflection point is thought to be a real indicator of an interesting paper that describes a conceptual change to the field. Yeah, I get, I guess, um, to pick up a little bit on that, right? There's this question of, um, we'd like to explain as much data as possible, but at the same time, so, you know, whatever loss function we'd like to bring to bear on a problem, it's got to, you know, favor models that explain the data well. At the same time, we as humans seem to have this um, condition for a shorter description length, you know, a more parsimonious model is better. But um, but to your point, that, that, that might well be a human thing rather than also a machine. Another another thought on that. So you were looking at the length of the you know the size of the statement versus the size of the 
there's a statement in Spivak's book about uh, generalized Stokes theorem. He says, um, this theorem has in common, has something in common with many mature results in mathematics in that the proof is trivial. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have something that's really useful and important and as, as the mathematics matures, the proofs get easier. Yeah, but the proof of Stokes theorem is short, relevant yes. to a very well-developed formal language right. if you try to express it fundamentally in terms of the axioms of CF, it wouldn't be so short. Maybe you could measure like like um this result shortens all, you know, you look at the space of all statements and it shortens them all. Yeah, take the sum of how much they have shortened. Actually, I wrote a nice uh, phrase uh, that the bare category theorem was a profound triviality that simplified and codified ideas of hundreds of mathematicians. But Maybe, you know, this profound triviality is something that I think you're heading toward the, the, the Stokes there, right? Mm -hmm. That there's value in the codifiers. Yeah, yeah the, the, the criterion you describe is a sort of complexity style of, of definition. How much is it short? You know, expected, you know, length of the proof. I mean, that one's certainly been uh, considered in this uh, literature. And then there's a kind of a subtlety that, uh, you, you can't really, you can't really estimate it, you know, because it's really the, 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 the theorems going forward that you'd like to, you know, just as much as the theorems you already know that, that you want to evaluate it on. And so you need to somehow also have some sort of rough or quick estimators. It's also like, you know, the same thing in reinforcement learning, you know, there's the actual cost or something, or, you know, or, or, you know it's, it's, you know, actual reward, and then there's the value, which is the estimate of it. And then it's that estimate, which really is like this human intuition of interestingness. You think something's interesting, but in the end, uh, it wasn't that interesting after all, but that was your first guess. And that's that's very important. And that's the thing where a you know, neural network or something would look at the statement and say, yeah, I'm interesting. Yeah. So, so those surely are parts of, of the system, but uh, there probably are other parts needed. I mean, uh, a place where the computers really, I, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen any system do this, is to come up with interesting definitions beyond the kind of exercise of let's take, say, an algebraic structure and uh, mutate or drop some of the axioms and see what we get. I mean, that's been done. But uh, other, you know, more, you know, more subtle, more structured definitions than that, there's been uh, very, very little work on getting computers to do that. And of course, that's, you know, really, you know, a much deeper question of mathematics. What is it that makes a, a definition interesting, you know, or a structure interesting? Wait, could you elaborate on what you answered using the busy beaver function? I mean, I, I think I know what that is, but what is the short statement that has a long proof related to busy beaver? Well, there's uh, the number of steps, and then there's the proof that it takes that number of steps. Uh, and the proof is just executing the algorithm yeah, and watching the machine right. steps. Uh, but there's no shorter proof that it takes that long. I thought that, that was the idea. Yeah. So this number is not known explicitly. I think uh, it's not up to like five. You know, yeah. So you just say they know it's five. Yeah, but but it, I think it, it maximizes your ratio. <laughs> but 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 I still not understanding what the statement of the theorem is associated with. Busy function. What is the statement? That well, the theorem is a BB of five is a between you know, 10 to the 100, 10 to the 100. Points. Yeah. yeah, so Mike, you mentioned definitions. I was going to say that some of the more yeah. profound advances in mathematics are when you get a new definition. So you mentioned Grobendieck, the definition of a scheme, before that, the definition of a topological space. Definition of the group. So, if machines are going to come up with that kind of definition, my limited experience with uh, these machine learning things, you can give it a very directed question, right? a very direct task, prove this statement. So, on. I mean, is that going to require a fundamental uh, evolution of how we interact with these things? And do you think that's possible that a 
should come up with a definition. I mean, I, I've said I take the position that everything is possible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I could throw out my answer to somebody else. My time. Do, 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 do you want to ask before we answer that? Or? No, I just wanted to keep asking. Okay, so it's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I mean, I mean my, my answer to that would be to say yes, it's a, it's a, it's a different level of, of, of thought. And so you do need to give the machine tasks that will make it also work on that level. And uh, yeah, there are things like that, you know, I mean, again, if you, if you have to program the computer to generate a code, of course, it does have to define a set of variables. It might have to define a data structure and so forth. And, you know, again, it's not doing that in a very deep way. It's probably just copying it out of other programs that you got in the corpus. But it, it, it did define a structure, you know, and so it's, that's the crucial concept. And uh, so if we set up a situation where we are asking it to define you know, sign signature axiom classes, it'll do it. You know, most of them will have no interest at all, but it'll do it. And I think that's doing it is our part getting actually you know, good ones. And of course, like you know, the, the, the group, you know, or the scheme, I mean, these things come to you know geniuses, you know, once a century. You know, but uh, you know, something uh, something on a more you know everyday level, you know, yes, you know, a structure that solves a particular problem, why not? Yeah, the, I mean, there's a paper called The AI Scientist that was recently released by Sakuna Lab and Jacob Forrester, and their objective is to generate an interesting scientific paper. Um, and within that interesting, you know, new scientific paper, there are new definitions, and those definitions might be cached out in terms of, I don't know, a combination of law, loss functions um, that have been previously used with a new name. And then uh, I think the idea of that lab is to iterate that process um, and sort of once the paper is published, add it to the, the set of documents that the um, models trained on or can condition on and sort of iterate very quickly. And then perhaps that could lead you to all parts of the space. Um, but that's the first thing I've seen like it in ML. Interestingly, they use another language model to like review the paper according to machine learning journal standards. Um, <laughs> Yeah, obviously that's the next level, and I don't think uh, currently there is any like a circulating idea of how to do it. I mean, the defining or introducing introducing new concept of uh, high importance. I mean, I don't see any uh, circulating idea. In I think it would be interesting to do a study of concepts in mathematics and try to understand, you know. It's, it can't be complete magic in finding these concepts. Somebody had an intuition, discovered the concept, right? So something, so it'd be interesting to do a study and try to understand how the concept was found, how it arose. Well, someone knew at what point in time to point their intuition towards what problem. No, the, 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 I, I, I mean, there is something to, to learn. I mean, like the, the, the case which is, Really, written that bad in detail, of course, is a group theory. You know, it's very the abstract group. It's got a law solving you know, building on, uh, I think it was Laplace, you know, this theory of solving the way you know, it's, 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 it's incredible. And uh, I mean, uh, I mean, a couple of other relevant comments. Again, you know, these existing discovery systems, the paradigm is generally you have some kind of axiom system like graph, you know. And uh, you know properties that it, it, well, I mean this, this, the system actually kind of can generate properties just by mutating formulas and things and so forth. And then it picks up this list of examples, you know, that it, it computes values or you say their properties and so forth. And it has a, has a way of producing new examples and then trying to abstract away. You know, when, you know, look at this property for all the examples. Oh, it's, it's never less than two. You know, maybe you can conjecture it's always always two. You know. And uh, so that same paradigm, of course, can, can work for, for definitions, you know, where the, you know, now we're going to look at axiom systems and all oh, this one for group is very interesting. You know, this one will be in the axiom. Now we, didn't, we, we weren't able to prove interesting things about that, you know. So the, the, the general paradigm is very, very uh, broad, but uh, you know, it, it, yeah, this is probably missing many things to make it really work well.
Well, you know, there's this joke about new concepts, right? That the reaction is always, well, that's ridiculous. Uh, and then it progresses to, uh, well, I thought of it first. To, uh, my teacher, Matt, in Moscow, was giving lectures on this in the 1960s. <laughs> uh, you know, so there is this aspect of most uh, innovations that uh, they were really quite necessary. That in retrospect, a lot of people are kicking themselves that they didn't uh, think of it, you know. And the things I've watched, you know, closely, well, often you'll find like Bill Thurston's work, work with Bromhoff, there's a lot of this character that, um, yeah, right. uh, ine inevitability from part of in, re in retrospect. But, you know, I, I can imagine that uh, a lot of this process could be automated because, like, in terms of Bromhoff's work, I think a, a major ingredient was in understanding vast swaths of hypothetical questions that could be asked in geometry, realizing that there were big lacunas where people didn't have the answers, and that very approximate answers would be uh, well received because no one knew any, any details. And a lot of this work had to do with this idea of zooming out, you know, these scaling spaces and looking at the geometric limits. And, uh, the actual technical work to get free from this is not terribly hard. Uh, it's more of the uh, inspiration that, that there's missing stuff. And maybe even language models can detect these areas that are missing without a deep understanding of the actual map, just the way, you know, introductions of a thousand paper tree. But when you were talking about the zooming out there, could you see that interfacing with something like type theory or interfacing with it seemed like um in order to start char characterizing what a good approximate solution in the space would look like there is a certain sense in which there's a kind of generic abstraction to see if there's any way to get it yeah i mean the kind of zooming in i was thinking of is something like looking at the integers and then from a broader perspective they sort of blend together and look like the real line yeah and, yeah uh, you know, grow up did a lot of work connecting discrete groups with continuous groups by taking limits that are slightly subtle, but not that subtle. Uh, yeah, interesting. There does seem to be an analogy to the way, for example, Lavoisier or Maxwell made some of their similar discoveries in that kind of that mode of generic abstraction. Um, yeah. Like we as scientists might say, one you'd be guided by something like a proto theory that is more expressed in terms of what are the sort of well formed statements and how could your notion of well forwardness be slightly modified, for example, in Lavoisier's case, considering air a chemical type rather than a physical type, allowed him to kind of explain a range of phenomena. So uh, that's the sort of thing I had in mind when I said mentioned types. I mean, something I wonder in that direction is whether um, human mathematicians have an advantage in some domain because. Our concepts are imprecise and riddled with error. And the history of science, in a way, is uh, imperfect models uh, because of their simplicity allow people to proceed and uh, make forward progress. You know, if, uh, if the theory of falling bodies had to be worked out in the presence of knowing about air resistance and angular inertia and this sort of thing. Uh, it might have been too complicated. That's right, yeah. You know, if you look at like the Lorenz model, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a kind of 2D simplification of a very basic atmospheric cell. Mm -hmm. But it was a lot in evidence. It, we also ignored a lot together. Yeah. Well, sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question about, um, you know, spoke about, you know, long-term future where AI mathematicians will sort of rule or do the mathematics. There's some kind of intermediary step in between, which we will see soon, where a significant fraction of the mathematics, maybe not the most interesting, will be done by machine next to the mathematicians. And when talking about you know what's useful, what's interesting, well, the main definition is interesting or useful to other mathematicians. So now we have the mathematicians and the AI guys, and they might have a different ID of what's interesting. So you know, you think we should care about what's interesting from our uh, human perspective or care of what's 
useful for the machines that are going to, to do a lot of the, the work. How do you see that? But I have a question for you. Do you believe that there is, let's say, human, but objective notion of significance in mathematics? Well, I'm not a mathematician, but I can tell that very early when learning mathematics, I could tell just by looking at it what's a theorem and what's a lemma. And I could tell you, and, and you know, there's a notion of use, usefulness. You don't call the theorem a lemma or a lemma a theorem, or it will be insulting to one or the other. Uh, you have an idea of what's a good or a bad definition. And you know, you know, if you get a counterexample, which definition you want to save and which definition you want to abandon. So do you yes, have an intuition. So the question there is, do you have an intuition about something that is an objective truth and you just have intuition about it? Or or is it something that's subjective? So so you that, that's the point. You might say that something is uh, interesting because it's useful. And and if you if you replace interesting by useful, it sense it's an interesting, it's a good definition because it's going to be useful to other mathematicians. You make a judgment which might be an objective fact or just a psychological opinion about how the rest of the mathematical community will probably use these statements. The same is true for machines. Basically, I could you know, end up with a concept that is going to be useful for those machine mathematicians that surround me there too, because it's it's well adapted to them on the representation of the things they use. Is it you know totally objective truth? I don't know, but it's it's something which is all the time. Yeah, Ernest had this notion of God's book, <laughs> the, the, like, the perfect proof of everything. Yeah. And there was sort of a sense of there is a God's book, and it has the most elegant proof of everything. And so that, that that makes it feel like there's some objective something. Well, it's his it intuition. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's definitely relative to the agent, which is uh, looking at and doing reasoning with it. If you're uh, super intelligent and uh, different things seem interesting, then you're merely intelligent or you know, kind of not like you're doing right now. But uh, once you get above that scale, probably all the, all the uh, considerations start to agree to say that you know, everybody believes such and such is interesting because it's teaching all of us. You know? Well, in, in this regard, I don't think we should think of human mathematicians really as individuals because yeah. we're raised in schools right. Right. that develop an aesthetic right. early on. And, you know, every, you know, in the 1960s, everyone was oriented to manifolds. Every school manifolds sort of seemed to rule the world wide. Of course, you smart people love that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very, uh, again, I mentioned some of these multi agent ideas and this question of whether it's you know, in some way necessary or at least a virtue to have more than one objective function, to have a, a essentially multi agent system as opposed to a single agent system. Yeah. Somehow I think uh, mathematicians can appreciate the beauty, beauty of uh, some results and like a theory. Um, so I, I believe it's important for human, mathematici human mathematicians to guide the development of a machine, mathemati machine mathematician to I mean, them and them in directions of um, how we evolve. Uh, I believe yeah, we have a certain like uh, aesthetic um, ability uh, to determine what's important, what, what's beautiful. I mean, uh, we are not really, uh, really 100% uh, thinking about what is uh, useful, but I think we, we I, because I chose mathematics because somehow I was fascinated by its uh, structures and like, um, uh, beauty, kind of beauty of the structures. I, I studied algebra first because it seemed uh, like a beautiful. Later, I moved to my, I mean, my interest has been moved, but uh, in any case. So I, I think it's important for a while, mathematicians should play an important role in the development. Otherwise, human human culture and okay, mathematical culture and civil, okay, okay, math, human mathematical culture may collapse. I think that's my opinion. So you're saying somehow that we would like those mathematical assistants or mathematical AI to be, you know, to be scientifically to our image, 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They need to look like us. Yeah, exactly. So if uh, like uh, AI, yeah, but that's not the way it worked with AlphaGo, right? Eventually, yes. it took its own direction. Oh yes, but uh, and, uh, and uh, any analyst knows. I, I don't actually know how that works. Yeah. Is there a real two-dimensional representation in the in AlphaGo? That is it. Is it somehow visualizing the plane, or is it just like this linear string of data? At the beginning, yes, and at the end, no. Yeah. And so it was at the beginning, yes, they were using the CNN. And at the end, John Russian. So there's no positional, there's no positional information in the binary. Really? So it can it can play go the way it plays, just thinking of a uh, linear string of the columns. I can't imagine how that works. It's <laughs> okay. <laughs> But wasn't there the example of this paper where they played Otello and in the embedding layer they discovered so they rediscovered that it had a representation? You can, you can learn, you can learn these representations. Yeah. So in Otello is there a representation of the Otello board? So, so further down. But somewhere in the net it's learned this too. Well that's what he said. Like also yeah. in chess, if you give um transformers just chess moves, yeah. then there's some evidence that they have an internal representation of the chess board, and then never been told. Or that there's a chessboard ever in the universe. Uh -huh. Not very good. Yeah. Not very good. Yeah. 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 So it's a bit emerging. So it's learning that there's a useful representation of the. I mean, in order to make a good prediction, it's actually useful to learn a representation of the Go board or chessboard or Tello board. Of course, Go is, 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 is a more complicated game than Otello. But yeah, so it, it, there's this emerging. Type of representation in the in the embedding space where it's it's actually quite easy to get the to be the like for instance a uh, simple example suppose you take a list of the plants that are so you have this list list and the list this list list and this every set of the US you associate the list of the plants so the plants the plants, plants. plants. Ah. and you encode this with by the you do the CA you get map of these. So, so getting a 2D yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah. It's a special yeah. organization, non spatial data, yeah. but quite easily, but it's simple to see it. Get that in box, and you can see it. Yeah, yeah. just see the same So, there is a difference in the brain of spatial. So the eyes. So the extent we can see that the eyes are similar to the norms that are a bit locally connected, but then you have a flow of extends uh, to the brain that you can manage to reconstruct it from the image of the brain. Uh, or, or have eyes, your eyes and my eyes, they work differently. Still see the same spatial images. Like. So, so I need spatial to train what I'm not. So, I just um, I've been totally fallen in love with the lectures of Kristen on this free energy principle. And, um, and kind of Bayesian brain hypothesis. So for people that aren't familiar with this, like a very extreme caricature is that our brains are just kind of predicting the entire time, but a lot of what we what we perceive as perception is in fact prediction. And then occasionally something surprising happens, mm -hmm. and then we actually perceive. Um, and one of the beautiful things in the in this free energy principle is that in some sense it gives us an objective function for conducting ourselves in the world because we just want to minimize surprise. Um, and I would like to kind of hear the panel's thoughts on the idea that we as mathematicians are inventing concepts in order to minimize surprise when we navigate the mathematical world. So for example, you know, Grothendieck's concept of a scheme or something, I think is very useful for me because it's very adaptable to many different situations. It's one, it's one concept that I have to understand. But it minimizes my surprise when encountering objects in our direct geometry. I 
there are certainly situations where it's, you know, that's that's not the right approach. You know, like, you know, you're exploring. You know, like, there are certainly situations where that's not the right approach. Like when you're exploring a novel environment, you, know, you can just sit in the in the doorway and never go there. But, no, no, uh, so you want to minimize surprise in the future. So if you're a toddler, it absolutely makes sense to smash a glass because you want to know what happens when you smash a glass. It, it, long term. It's not that you want to remain, I mean, probably Rory can explain this much better than I can, but. Well, if anyone wants to hear Carl explain on the 23rd of October in London, we have a summit where he'll be talking about free energy principle and AI and that sort of thing. I think also if people are unfamiliar with free energy principle, you can also think about it in terms of the evidence that I found. It's a similar decomposition um, of the KL divergence. And, and so, but yeah, thinking more broadly about the philosophy of, uh, uh, yeah, it's an interesting, I hadn't thought about applying it to mathematics in that way. Um, so that's an interesting proposition. Yeah, I get the, the other, the other like set of, so, so free energy principles are kind of computational level principle to do with like the competence of the system and, and doesn't include anything to do with the performance of the system. And so you might be able to um, also integrate aspects of how, you know, genuinely the difficulty of proof or finding a proof um, is used to do with uh, MP hardness and things factor in. In a way, the free energy principle is, is sort of um, like it doesn't make any predictions about. Can I, can I just ask something totally new? Um, I, I actually wanted to get back to your point about the the, the um, impending existential crisis in mathematics. I mean, if, if we really do believe that um, that these systems can eventually become smarter than mathematicians, um, I mean, what mathematicians do is actually not that necessary. At least what most mathematicians do at this moment is not really that necessary. So, so, so somehow the it really seems like a very big existential crisis. Um, so what do you think about that? I mean, I, I mean, if we, yeah, um, what will we, what will we be doing? So I think it's important to develop an AI to explain. Uh, AI it's thinking to us uh, in the process. So we have to not develop this AI mathematician too fast or like uh, out of a touch. Uh, we have to control the process. Otherwise, uh, it, it may be a disaster. So I mean, it, it's not only for mathematics or, or also for other areas probably. If we uh, like make AI to develop itself, without like a human intervention at some point, then uh, there may be a really good, like alpha zero. Uh, but at the same time, uh, yeah, it, it, it's scary. So likewise, uh, when it develop uh, AI mathematician, uh, we have to control the process. and We have to make the uh, AI to explain uh, at least the important aspects of uh, uh, its thinking to us so that we may communicate, that we may have some like, uh, methods to communicate with the, the AI. Otherwise, yeah, I think it's a disaster. And then probably many other uh, AI experts have concerns about uh, that thing. I mean, not, not only for mathematics, for other, other developments. I, I would be more positive. I mean, I would, on the one hand, say that definitely there are Huge risks associated with AI, not specific to mathematics, but maybe mathematics has the possible risks. But then, you know, again, there's both the kind of the applied side of it, where I mean, it, 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 you can imagine just you know unbelievable possibilities. You know, where uh, we could model you know the human body and uh, do you know advanced medicine you know tremendously. You know, we we could. Discovery, you know, again, outside of machine, you know, proves the Riemann hypothesis, and, and then we go, we, we use it as long as we keep control, we use it to go much farther. We start asking very broad, you know, ranging questions that we couldn't even imagine. You know, for example, understand the proof. 
Yeah, even if we can't understand the proof, that's right. I mean, there'll be this uh, one branch of people that says, here's this huge proof, let's try to mine it for what we can understand about why the Riemann hypothesis is true. And then there'll be this other branch that says, here are these thousand incredible statements that we know are true, and what what picture, what mental picture can we build from them? Maybe we could ask the AI to write a scientific American level article. Right, that's course. right, that's right. That's <laughs> what we have to do. So it's, it's, but, uh, you know, certainly the upside is you. <laughs> but I mean, there are papers now that say, assume that the hypothesis is true, and then. So that's right, that's right. It's probably that one wouldn't be as significant as the ultra hypothesis that it came up with. But, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I can give a very personal answer to that. Um, you know, what is the meaning of life? Um, are we competing to achieve, you know, to get fame and, and credit? Um, or there's this other thing that I would really like is just to understand things. And, you know, if we had, you know, I, I'm trying to, understand, I would like to understand quantum field theory. I don't. That's what I would like to. But I find that physicists get very impatient with me. <laughs> there are things I don't understand. And it, and it would be amazing to have, you know, something I could talk to that would listen to me <laughs> answer my questions. So that's a different, it's a different spin. I just have a, one sort of comment to make, and I wanted to pose the question to the group. Uh, going back to the uh, notion of whether you should align artificial intelligence to like what humans believe is important, vis a vis what some agnostic notion of it. And somebody, uh, I don't recall who said, you know, in the 60s people talk about manifolds a lot, and the 70s was this and that. What I'm curious about is like, what are the trends that did not take hold, but were valid after that? So that seems to be more of an interesting question. And the reason why is, like, I don't know if anyone's talked about this, but there's clearly a sociology to mathematicians. There's a subject called the science of science. I don't know who does it. It's someone from Northeastern, but they're studying, like, how scientists and Full thing up. spreads in the social networks. So it's clear that, like, there's a bias between what mathematics is done and what isn't. And I think the value of the tool would be to look at the trends that aren't making, because there's probably gold there from, like, a data mining standpoint. That's my observation. There are certainly many examples of that in, uh, in my field of theoretical physics. And there was a point in uh, the development of string theory where we had what, what we called a Schenker's principle after my um, colleague uh, Steve Schenker at Rutgers, which was whatever you know the topic in theoretical physics that you hate the most, that's going to be the basis of the next breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think those are the most interesting cases where it's neglected and then it's discovered again. All right. Actually, maybe you could ask an AI to answer your question that is to search the mathematical literature and identify ends that were sort of dead ends for sociological rather than mathematical reasons. Uh, Passions changed and people stopped writing about this topic, but they didn't really finish solving their problems. And... Well, that's a that one could try that one at GPT for it's not, it's not so hard. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> maybe with that, uh, um, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the hour is over, and I think it was a very good, very insightful discussion. So, first of all, thanks to the audience for asking the questions, and of course, uh, thanks for the panelists for answering them. <laughs>